Hello and welcome to the Large and Unnecessary First Player Token Podcast. This is episode 92. My name is Chris. I'm David. Is that it? Looks like it. <laughs> How long has it been since we've had, had a two-man show? I can't even it's remember. It's been a long time. It's been a very long time. I was time. thinking that. Uh, so just to say, Pavel uh, has come back from his holiday and gone straight into work. Yeah, another, <laughs> just... another of Pavel's mysterious holidays that he seems to take. <laughs> Off in Norway this time. What's he up to? I don't. Nobody knows. Have you ever seen like Pavel's holiday plans? Like, see when he we've been there, he decides to go they, somewhere. Did they go very close to like military installations? Because um, this is my suspicion. Huh, that's I'm a good starting point, to though. think like he spends an awful lot of time on the west of Scotland. Just, I mean, like you know, he's like, oh, where are you? Oh, you're off to Loch Long again, Pavel. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very big big lens you've got on your camera. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if you've ever seen, like, he plans his holidays meticulously. Yeah, he does. Like, I, I, he showed me his uh, his folder for when... He had a folder for his holiday for when he uh, he, he went a to dossier. Japan. He went to Japan and it was, like, it was all in, like, you know, plastic binder things. And it was all, like, bookmarked and tabbed and stuff like that. And, uh, <laughs> and it was all just, like, the most meticulously planned holiday I've ever seen. He doesn't go on holiday and just go, what will we do today? Ah, let's just have a walk about and see what's here. It's all just, he has it all planned in advance. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's that, a very is very, that is very man. Japanese, I must say. Aye. I, I went on holiday uh, with one of my friends whose wife is Japanese and she kind of did the same thing. And it was <laughs> tough. It was like hard hard work. We, we, we saw a lot. It was great, but it was... Like, but yeah, you had to stick. We we're, were glad when like it finished. We could just go. <laughs> we could just go to the pub. Yeah, we just go for a drink, <laughs> just chill out for a bit. <laughs> of course, pa- Pavel doesn't like that kind of thing. He doesn't like people having fun. Um, I'm pretty sure that this Norway holiday has been the same. I'm pretty sure he's uh, he's meticulously planned it because I definitely like, there was Facebook comments of people saying, "Oh yeah, you're nearby this place. You should go and check it out." And Pavel's like, "No, that's not on the itinerary." <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Ewan's not here either, um, so I'll just we'll just make a mini announcement right here because I think Ewan's going to take a step back from the video games episodes from now on. Um, he's he's a busy guy. He's he's doing a lot of uh, he, he plays his banjo quite a lot in various mm. places around Edinburgh, and he seems to be doing that more and more and more. So he's not got a lot of time for playing video games these days. No. but that's fair enough. He's still uh, he's still big on his board games, so you'll still hear him on the board games episodes. Mm-hmm. But I think the video games episodes are mostly going to be me, you, and Pavel now. I think. So that's sad, but you know, you've got to move on, so... He'll be fine. He'll still be around, don't worry about it. I'm sure he'll make an appearance in some video game for episodes. For Banjo Quest. Yeah, for Banjo Quest, Pavel <laughs> Quest. Um, and definitely when uh, we finally get round to finishing Shenmue 2. I mean, we've now got to the point where Shenmue 1 and 2 have now been released on uh, PlayStation and <laughs> like PC and stuff like that. Yes. The remastered versions. Um, which I've been so tempted to buy, man. Like it's like twenty five quid in the PlayStation Store for Shemu One and Two, and I'm just like, oh, I own these on the Dreamcast, but you know, do I want to try and get these sort of upgraded controls and stuff because it's a very clunky game on the Dreamcast, even though it's brilliant. So the temptation's there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I still think I uh, that me and Ewan should finish playing it on the Dreamcast for that, uh, Definitely. for that authentic feel, <laughs> the original feel of what it's like to play through Shemu One and Two. Um, on an this... aging Dreamcast. <laughs> My Dreamcast, you have to turn it upside down. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's... I'm sure we For... talked about it on, the, on this podcast when we first started playing Shenmue, which was two years ago, <laughs> the first Shenmue when we started playing, um, that I dropped the Dreamcast on the floor in the flat that we were in at the time. And it just bounced all over the place, and it still worked. It was fine <laughs> for a console that's now. How old is that console now? Oh, it's nearly know. twenty years old now. Probably, probably about that. Uh, was it the late nineties? The Dreamcast came out. Yeah. No. Oh, I can't even remember. Uh, it was around about that yeah, time, though. Yeah, so it must it was, be. It must be yeah. around about the twenty-year-old mark now. Yes. Um, things indestructible. I'm telling you. Yeah, they made they made consoles pretty tough back then. <laughs> I don't think I could drop my 
uh, PlayStation 3. And oh, God, no. It would, that plastic it's made out of would just shatter into a million pieces. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very careful with my modern consoles. I have to say. They, they don't look like they're up to much, do they? No, but you know, the original NES, uh, oh, yeah. that thing was tough because my cousin had one and he had like sort of ADHD and sort of anger management issues. And <laughs> so he used to just lose the plot because he oh couldn't, dear. couldn't handle oh it. Dear. And there were times he, he, he literally jumped on top of it, wearing his shoes and like, the top of it was all buckled from him jumping. He was, he was a kid, but yeah, yeah. it was all buckled and caved in. Still worked. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I mean, that was just a box, though. That was a tank, that thing. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so I, I don't know if we mentioned, but we'll be talking about video games this week. Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure you gathered that from our chat there. Uh, we've got a few things to talk about. I was hoping to have an early access episode, but you've gone and ruined it by playing an actual game. I know, sorry. <laughs> it's about, well, the, the quality of it is kind of on a par with early access. If, if that, All right. If that counts, we could sort of pretend. So this is a pretty much early access episode. But it is episode. finished, though. So. Right. <laughs> so, there we go. Massive criticism already from the off. <laughs> but we'll get to that game, because first of all, we're going to talk about something that I've been itching to talk about for about three weeks now. Um, but you guys kept stopping me for some reason and saying, nah, talk about this other game. Mm. Um, but it's quite a popular game. Um, it's Slay the Spire, uh, which is, I think, that, is this just on Steam? I'm going to have to check that. Yeah, Win, aye, Windows, OS X, Linux. Oh, and it's coming out on the Switch next year. That's perfect. That's This is this is the kind of game that you would play on the Switch. Because um, we were just discussing this earlier, because I was asking you if you had actually played any Slay the Spire. Yeah. I think you were saying it's on your wish list. I'd only but... aspired to. Ah, see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were talking about this is probably a perfect game for like mobile platforms um, mainly because as I was saying it involves no sort of like finger dexterity or anything this is because it's a turn based uh, game um, it's, a, it's a roguelike which is one of my favourite types of games because mm. they're very very addictive and you know I do a lot of travelling about on trains and stuff so being able to play things like that is great. Are they calling? Have they called it a rogue like or a lo- rogue light? Um, it's a rogue like, right? Oh. see this. <laughs> come on then, tell me what the difference is. Well, I, they've come <laughs> up with this new term, and I think it was. I assumed it was because some people were saying uh, these games are not rogue likes. Yes. Based on the sort of definition of what a rogue like used to be, uh, in that it was. A character, a title, you know, a character, uh, text characters, and there were certain certain key things that that had to have, uh, you know, the procedural generation, but permadeath also, and a lot of these games that are now being described as roguelikes don't have uh, permadeath. Some do, but not all of them do. So they've, I thought that's what they'd come up with this new term, roguelite, which is yeah, weird. Well, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's it's a very uh, like muddy term I think I don't know it's it's really confusing because there is a difference between rogue likes and rogue lights and I think rogue lights are the games that are more like the original rogue I, I thought it was the other way around. No, see, I, no, maybe rogue, you're right. Cause rogue, well, it might have shifted because roguelike was a term way before these new generation of games. Like roguelike, NetHack is a roguelike, for example. Yes. Because it's not rogue. Because it's like they, rogue. Yeah, but it was very, <laughs> very, very. And, all, and the other, like Angband and the various others. Uh, so that was around, uh, you know, in the 90s. Uh, and roguelite is more recent. But anyway... I'll, I'll I'll do some research so, on this and come back. Unexplored, <laughs> you know what I find out. <laughs> unexplored is a game that I quite enjoy, and that's a that's considered a rogue light, I believe. And I don't know if it's just the developers that call it that, but yeah. um, but I mean that's probably more like rogue than a some lot of the other some of the others, yeah. That, so that's why I'm thinking the rogue light might be. The, <laughs> oh, correct. I'm really confused. Like, write in and tell us, write in and tell us what the difference is here. Um, settle an argument but I mean I, I don't know should we even get involved in that kind of chat because does it really matter because I think that the thing is that rogue like games if you want to these these kind of games that do have these things I mean let, let's look, look up the Wikipedia definition here um, procedurally generated levels turn based gameplay tile based graphics and permanent death that's what they describe rogue like yeah, as that, being to me that's the original uh, that's the original that's what it was with the tile based graphics and uh, so this game certainly doesn't have tile based graphics because it's it doesn't it's 
not that kind of game. No, but it does. But I understand, like, I understand why people describe them as these things because, like, why bother coming up with a new term for them? Mm. <laughs> Unroguelike. I don't know. Like, what's, what would the term be? <laughs> Ro- roguish. Roguish. Yeah, that would that would probably work. <laughs> Let's go. Right. So, Slay the Spire is a roguish game. All right. Um, now it's a. It's interesting because it's it's one of these games that hits that sort of crossover for our podcast because it's almost like a card game, mm. um, but it's a deck building card game. And deck building games are quite fun games to play for me. I think when we play sort of tabletop games, I quite like games that involve. You know, you get to add cards to your deck every so often. Um, some of them, not so much. <laughs> I mean, I'm not really a fan of Dominion. I well, find that game to be tedious. There's sort of, yeah, there's different kinds of deck builders. Dominion is sort of cited as the original deck builder. Yeah. But I don't even know if that's true, but that's that's what people tend to say. But it's a, it's a particular type of deck building game, and other games have come along since then that, that work in My a, mage diff- a different way. Yeah, like Mage Knight, it's just different. Technically, yeah. you build a deck, but the game is nothing like Dominion. And then the Pathfinder card game, yeah. again, the same. So, yeah, uh, it's Slay the Spire. I mean, it has. does it have a fantasy theme? It's a fantasy theme. Yeah. It's, it's a strange, well, I mean, I say Ish. a fantasy theme, but there's a, there's a particular character in this game that uh, is definitely not a fantasy type character. Um, so there's three characters that you can play as and you have to unlock well, you, you, the, the one at the start is the Ironclad um, but there's two more that you can unlock and one of them's called the Defect and he's more of a sort of robot right? Um, and a pretty strange one as well um, I've only played with two of the characters so I've played as the Ironclad um, and I've played as the Defect and the only reason I've played as the Defect because he's the last character you unlock and I've not actually unlocked him yet but if you play one of the daily the daily challenges you can play as that character see um if he's the daily challenge that that mm. week so i have played as a defect the other character the silent um is more of an assassin type character um i've not played as her um not not for any particular reason just because i haven't played the game enough it's just that i got really obsessed with playing as the ironclad because i got really used to his cards and i'll get to that in a second so the point is to lay the spire is that as you might imagine you have to get to the top of the spire and kill the final boss Ah, okay. Now you're doing sounds, that. This sounds very like rogue. Okay. Yeah. In fact, it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> except that you're going up instead of down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, the way that you're doing that is that you're presented with like a map, um, and there's just various paths that you can choose, and each path has a different type of room at the end of it, and you can see the entire path. So you've you've got like they call them levels instead of rooms. So mm-hmm. you, each each time you go into a new room, you're going up a level on the spire, mm-hmm. um. But I think there's like three different maps sort of thing. And the first one that you're on will have a boss at the end of it. And then you'll move on to the next one. And you don't get to see that until you've beat the first boss. And it doesn't really matter so much, actually. Um, because you get to choose... The, there's generally three or four starting points that you can choose. So a room that you can start in. And then from from there, you can see the branching paths that will go up through different rooms. So there's diff- the different types of rooms, they have like, they'll have like monsters in them. So you'll just have a fight in that room. Um, they'll have maybe a shop... Um, there might be an event room, which is like a question mark thing. So something will happen. You might have to make a choice. Something might happen to you. You might get some good stuff or bad stuff happening to you, depending on that. And um, there are camps where you can rest. Um, and there's like random rooms. Actually, I think those are the question mark rooms. Um, the random rooms are just like you know, you, one of those things will happen. You might find a shop. You might find a, mm-hmm. an elite monster or something like that. It just just depends. Uh, just completely random. You don't know what's coming. Um. So when you go into one of these rooms, if you're fighting a monster, um, you're presented with so like we'll, we'll go we'll go through as the Ironclad here because this is the character that I've played as the most. Um, and then the Ironclad, you have a starting deck with the Ironclad, and that deck is just going to have ten cards in it, and most of those cards are going to be basic attack cards, so they'll be like strike cards, they're called. They'll do six damage, um, or you'll have block cards. I think they give you like four block. Um, and there's one other card in that deck. I can't remember exactly what it is, but I think it does some sort of status effect and does some damage. And that's like your 10-card hand. Mm-hmm. Now, you will fight monsters in these rooms, and all, all that happens is that you, at the start of every fight, your deck is shuffled and you're given five cards. And you have three energy. So the cards have costs on them, and this is going to be very familiar to anybody that's played any kind of card game like this, like Magic the Gathering, anything like that. Um, you've got a cost associated with the cards that you play, and you spend your energy to play those cards. 
Um, now the monsters in the room, uh, you get to see. You'll see some monsters. It might just be one. It could be four. It could be five. It could be however many. Uh, the monsters, because it's turn-based, basically you'll play your card and then the monsters will do an attack, but you'll you'll get to see what attack they're going to do, so you can do a lot of planning ahead. Uh. Okay, um, sometimes they might not attack, sometimes it'll just say they're going to do some sort of negative status effect on you, but you don't know what that status effect is yet. Do do the monsters have decks in this game? Or no, is it not they like just that? do... Right. They, they're just okay. pre pro I mean, they'll do like a... They're pre-programmed, but mostly most of the monsters will just do something random. But some of sure. them have sort of pre-programmed attacks, so they won't do something until they've done this first or something like that, you know. Um, so yeah, you might see that the monsters are going to do some sort of status effect on you or on themselves, or they might be healing, or they might be blocking or something like that. So you get to kind of see what the monsters are doing, so you can plan your turn. Um, so it might say, like, this monster's going to hit you for seven damage. And then this other monster's going to hit you for four damage twice. And that's that's what like a sort of important mechanic in the game. Um, because one of the things about this game is that it's actually quite deep in terms of how you can plan for things. So, for example, if a monster's going to attack you for seven, then that's fair enough. That's just one hit. But if a monster's going to attack you for four damage twice in that turn, then that's two hits. And if you've got certain things going on, so, like, they have like a thorns ability in this game. So every time you take damage, you'll deal mm. three damage back, for example. So if a monster hits you once, they take three damage. If they hit you for four damage twice, they'll take six damage because they're hitting you twice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can you can do different things and, and you, you learn the monsters as you go through as well. So like the monsters are... Like if you come up against a certain monster, say like a giant bird of some sort, you know the kind of attacks that monster's going to do. So you can already, once you've kind of played the game a few times, you can already start thinking about what it is that you're going to do against this monster before you've even seen what any of their attacks or anything, because you already know mm -hmm. uh, the kind of things they're going to do. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but it's just like a game of, you, you play cards until you run out of energy and then you go from there. But the, the, the basic functions of the game are just, you know, attacking and blocking. But every time you win a fight, you'll get a new card in your deck, okay? And you get a choice of three. So you'll be shown three cards and you can choose one of these. And the cards have uh, different, like, rarities. They have different... They're, they're, they're kind of split into three different categories. So you've got, like, attack cards, you've got skill cards, you've got power cards. Um, so your attack cards are pretty basic. You, you know, you're just hitting something. Um, your skill cards will do things like giving you block. They might do status effects, that kind of thing. Um, and the power cards are generally they cost more than any other card generally just depends um but they'll give you an ongoing power for the rest of that fight and right. those are very very powerful cards uh, to have and you'll tend to find that when you are building your deck as you go through or i tended to find that i am building my deck based around a lot of these power cards but also there are relics in the game and relics are basically like power cards except you have them all the time so you don't have to play them sure um, so, like, at the start of the game, the Ironclad comes with a relic, which uh, I think after every f fight, he heals six hit points. Mm -hmm. And that's his starting relic. Um, but you'll get other relics as you go through the game. And, I get, like I say, you will start uh, building your deck around these things. Um, so I'm just I'm going to give, like, examples of some of the relics. So, like, the Anchor gives you start the combat, every combat with ten block. Um the pen nib, um, every 10th attack is double damage. Right. Uh, bottled Flame, as soon as you pick up the Bottled Flame, you choose an attack card that's in your deck, and that card is always in your hand at the start of the fight, every mm. fight after that. Cool. Very, very useful, these kind of things. Um, mummified Hand, uh, when you play a power card, a random card in your hand then costs zero. Right. Okay. Um <clears throat> so, so, like, yeah, these, these relics are extremely powerful things, and... Um, generally, like, when you fight a boss and defeat it, you get to choose a relic. Um, but you will be picking up other relics as you go through the game. So, for example, when you go to the shop rooms, you can buy relics in there if you've got enough money. Because you get gold for defeating monsters and stuff. It's one of these, you know, just standard things where you're just picking up currency as you go through. Um, but you can also buy cards in the shop as well. Um, one of the cards is always on sale. It's always just some random card. <laughs> <laughs> it's always on sale. You get it for half price or whatever. Um... And yeah, the game is just generally you're just going through all these different rooms and every time you win a fight, you get a choice of three cards and when you get those three cards up, you'll sit there and go, okay, right, what of these cards is going to complement the deck I've got right now? 
Um, and then, you know, as you go to the shops and you can buy more cars there, and you're like, okay, right, I can really, you know, I've got loads of gold here. I can buy three or four cars out of the shop here and get these into my deck. And your deck is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go up through the spire, which can cause problems for anybody that's played these kind of well, games that's before. That's what I was going to ask. Are there... Are there any there, mechanisms for removing yes, cards? but in general, it's expensive. Right. Just to get rid of one card, that can cost quite a bit of gold. So there is a sort of, like, every time you go to the shop, you can go to, yeah, you can choose a, you can choose a, an option to get rid of one of the cards in your hand. Right. right. Um, but there are other ways of doing it. So some of these random events might mm-hmm. get rid of cards in your hand. Yeah, just, like, various things could happen as you go through the spire that can get rid of cards in your hand, in your deck, sorry. Um, but... In general, you will end the game if you get to the top of the spire and finish it. You're going to have quite a lot of cards in your deck. Mm-hmm. Um, so quite a lot of the time, you are just thinking about like anything you pick a card up. In fact, you can re- anything you fight a monster and you can pick a card up, I'm pretty sure you can just refuse to take one of them. Sure. Um, okay. In fact, yeah, that is yeah. an option. So you don't have to fill... So you don't, you don't want to be filling your deck with cards that you're not going to use because why... There's no point in you getting a card in your hand that you're just going to say, well, that's useless to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's quite interesting because, you know, you're playing as, like I'm playing as, uh, or I was playing as the Ironclad for most of this game. Um, but there's different strategies that you can use. So there's different ways you can build your deck. And quite a lot of the time, because of the nature of the game, because it's just random cards that are offered to you after fights, you're not going to use the same deck mm-hmm. every time mm-hmm. you play through as the Ironclad. You're going to be like, well... I've just picked up this power that's going to say give me extra strength or something like that. So I'm just going to maybe take cards that are going to complement that. Yeah. Rather than trying to go for a specific strategy every time. So it's 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 fun to just play with it, just to go through and see what these cards are. And every time you like play through and you die, you'll get experience. So if you die, you're dead. That's it, permadeath. Mm-hmm. And you have to go back to the start of the spire and play with a new deck. Yeah. Um but every time that happens, you'll get unlocks. So new it's, cards will get added yeah, to the library that you say. can then choose from in the future. Yeah. So there's there is def- there's definitely things that happen that keep you wanting to go and play back through the spire again and well what are these cards going to be next time, you know? Um and definitely some of the more powerful cards come through doing that. Mm-hmm. Um uh, there are other things the 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 actual decks themselves, the cards themselves are colored. So the Ironclad, I think it's blue cards, possibly or possibly red. I can't remember. So it's one of the it's one of the colors. Um, they're all Ironclad cards. So when you're playing through as the Ironclad, you're only going to see Ironclad cards. The exception being that there are colorless cards yeah. in the game. There are white uh, cards that any character can take, but they're pretty rare. Like you, I don't think you ever get offered those after a, the end of a fight. You can buy them in shops. You can get them through vet events and random things like that. Um, some relics will do things like at the start of every combat, you'll get a random colorless card in your hand. Some of these colorless cards are pretty powerful as well. Um, some of them are just healing cards, which are few and far between, mm. uh, these healing cards. So it is, it is kind of quite useful to have these things. Um, the cards can also be upgraded Goodness. So if you go to a camp, your choice. You, this is an interesting choice as well that they make you, they make you have. So when you go to a camp, you can either rest and get some of your hit points back, or you can upgrade one of the cards in your hand, but not both. <laughs> so so you, whenever you go to a camp, you do have this choice. And every time I went to a camp on like my first or second run through, I was just like, no, no, rest, heal. We need hit points. I need hit points. Need hit. But sometimes that isn't the best thing to do. Sometimes it's better to upgrade a card because upgrading a card can. It can do one like it generally does one of two things. It either lowers the cost of the card, or it improves the abilities on the card itself. So, yeah. and it actually turns out that you know having improving the ability on a card can really make a massive difference, especially when you're comboing some of these cards. So, like when I played through the one the first time that I slayed the spire, um. And it was it wasn't it was maybe like my tenth, maybe eleventh, twelfth run through, something like that, somewhere in that region. I had a ridiculous like combo um going on where basically I had cards in my hand and relics and all these things that, that made it so that I mean, I never really explained the block mechanic, and I should probably do that before I go any further. Um but the block mechanic basically just anytime you get hit, so if you play a bunch of block cards, so let's say you've got twelve block, the first twelve hit points you would lose, you don't lose. 
okay? But any unused block at the end of the monster's turn that you have um, disappears. So you go back to zero right, block, yeah. okay? But there's cards that, like, the Juggernaut, uh, the Juggernaut, the, uh, the Ironclad can have, and I think it's called the Juggernaut card. Um, no, no, it's not. It's called the Barricade card, which means your block doesn't expire at the end of the monster's turn. But then you can get certain cards in play, and if you get them at the right times um, with the Ironclad, the you can build your block up and then double it with certain cards. So you can get you can build up twelve block in a turn, double it to twenty four, and you know that the monsters are only going to hit you for like say twelve that turn. Mm -hmm. So you've still got twelve block. And what I did when I slayed the spire the first thing was that I used these cards, these comboing these cards together, the uh, like the barricade card and stuff, uh, with the doubling the the block amount to the point where I had I just didn't hit the, the boss at all like I just didn't hit him just kept on ignoring him just didn't hit him didn't hit him just kept building this block up and building it up and building it up building it up to the point where I had 512 block <laughs> right <laughs> but then I had another card in my hand called body slam where it deals your block as damage so I basically just built the block up to a ridiculous level and then played Body Slam and just smashed the boss to pieces. Oh, wow. And it was it was one of those really satisfying moments. And that's what you get in Slay the Spire. It's when you get these really satisfying moments where you realise that you've got these relics, these cards, you can combo all the shit together and do something ridiculous. <laughs> like, but don't get me wrong, the game's not easy. This is a hard game. Um, I, I believe the ha it has got easier as the development has gone on because, as I say, it's still in early access, this game. Um, but it's a difficult... It's a hard game, and I'll, like most of the runs that you go through, you, you might not even make it out of that first part of the dungeon, basically, because you'll just get killed. It's it's so it's so easy uh -huh. to just get slaughtered, and especially in the early parts of the game. But everything you take a step up into the next region, uh, the monsters get harder. And you have to be ready for that. You have yeah. to you have to be kind of making sure that when you go into that place, you're ready for that. Um, and there's all the other things. I mean, I don't want to go on too much, but there is even more going on in this game than you would imagine. Like status effects, things like strength adds to your damage, doesn't expire, but then there's things that monsters can do that can get rid of your strength. Uh, you can apply weakness to monsters with certain like skill cards or attack cards might do it as well. Weakness means that the monsters do 25% less damage to you. Um, you can make them vulner vulnerable, <laughs> so they yeah. get 50% more damage. Yeah, there's, there is... There's a lot going on in this. Um, it's it's great. I love it. It's just such a it's an addictive game, and it's so easy to play. And the game helps you along. The game holds your hand a little bit because it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't tell you exactly what to do. But when you hover over a card, it tells you exactly what all the status effects on that card will do. For example, and if you hover over a monster who's going to do something, it'll tell you what that monster is going to do to you. Mm -hmm. So it's like it, it's. It, it it tells you and it, it's helpful without making it so that you're you feel like you're being babysat or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's it's really it's a, it's a, a good looking game as well. It's you know fantasy style, colorful, fucking great art, um, good animations and stuff like that. Yeah, it's 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 solid and it's an addictive game. I absolutely love it. Yeah, I can see why it's. It is, I've noticed that it's very very well reviewed. On Steam, very popular, I uh, or has been for a while. It reminds me of there's a game I play on my phone called Dream Quest. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> Dream Quest. I think it's called Dream Quest. I was just uh, having that, uh, having a look. Which is a deck builder as well. And it's, <laughs> Dream Quest is weird because it, it was just done by one guy and he just drew all the cards himself and he can't draw. So all the cards are just <laughs> like stick Fingers. figures. Oh, yeah. So you might have seen it. So like Attack 3 is just like three sort of poorly drawn swords <laughs> and there's lots of little <laughs> stick men holding clubs and things. <laughs> and it all, it, it's all done in that style. Uh, and it's just a very, very small deck building game. But the, this Slay the, and it, it's fine, it's good, but it, Slay the Spire sounds like a much more refined version of it. And I don't just mean the graphics, I mean, it, they've they've solved a lot of the issues that uh, this other game that I play uh, has, because uh, it's just way too punishing, like just ridiculously difficult. So, mm. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I'd definitely be keen to, to pick this up. It's good fun, like, I mean... 
like I say, I, I, I can lose hours to play in this game and you, you'll just keep going back and starting a new run again and going, right, okay, I've got a better plan this time if I get these cards. And obviously then you'll then pick up completely different cards and go, huh, right, okay, maybe try this then. And that's what I like about it, it's the fact that you can play with it. And the different character classes, they have different yeah. feels to them. Um, like I say, I haven't played as the, the assassin type character, um, but playing as the, uh, what was that I called him? The the defect. He's got like weird abilities where he can basically spawn floating orbs around him uh, using different cards. And these orbs at the end of every turn will do certain things, like they'll attack a cert- they'll attack a random enemy or they'll give you block or whatever. And you can just keep spawning them. And every time you spawn one, like you have a number of slots which you can increase with playing different cards as well um, for these orbs. But every time you spawn a new orb, if your orb if your orb slots are already full, the first orb that you spawned will do something ridiculous, <laughs> right? Before it dies, so like it might if it's an attack orb, it might do loads of extra damage and then just fizzle out, uh-huh. and then your new orb will appear, and that'll so you, like that that's a pretty cool system as well. It's like so so the, it's not just a a straight up hitting things and you know it's just playing cards and doing things. You you can do these mad things like planning ahead and coming up with these ridiculous strategies. It does sound like a, a worthy uh, entry into the rogue style canon. The roguish. The roguish, yeah. Because that having uh, just one more turn kind of aspect. That, is a roguish that, that's thing. That's a key part of them. Like you're, you're like, you, you have a shot and you're like, oh, I didn't go very well. I died. Well, I'll go again because I, I think it can be, I think I can do better. Yeah. I just want to see. And it being different each playthrough as well, not just being the same thing. Uh, and yeah, well, not with Rogue, but with, well, not so much with Rogue, but with later ones that had classes as well. And they made the game different again. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to allow it. <laughs> Dave's rogue stamp of approval uh, so yes that's Slay the Spire I don't want to go on about it too much more because I think I've probably talked about that for more than 20 minutes now <laughs> but, but uh, it, like I say it is available on at the moment Windows OS X and Linux um, it's definitely on Steam I think it came out in early access at the end of last year the end of 2007 uh, 2007? 2017, <laughs> I believe. Um, I think it is getting its full release at some point this year. Um, oh, it doesn't sound like it's missing much. I mean, No, I think it's from pretty it, refined You could add now. extra characters, but beyond that, it seems like it's... Yeah, I think it is like pretty film. much finished yeah. by the looks of it. It seems so polished that... Um, I, if if they hadn't I'd put a massive message at the start of the game saying that this game's in early access, I would never have guessed. Mm. Put it that way. Um, cool. So yes, it's by... Uh, Mega Crit <laughs> LLC. Okay, right. Let's uh, let's move on, Dave. It's your chance to now talk my year off. So, tell me about a hat in time. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a a curiously named game. Uh, it's, it came out in October two thousand and seventeen. So it's been about for a wee while, and it's another it's another game that's been on my wish list on the. On Steam, but I actually picked this up on the PlayStation. And it's a 3D platformer that you play in third person. And it's in the sort of old style of 3D platformers. Well, such as Mario 64, I suppose, and things like uh, Donkey Kong, uh, Jack and Daxter, Banjo-Kazooie. They seem to be big fans of that as well. So... If you could remember those, and it and it looks like it as well. They've definitely gone for a, a retro look and feel. And uh, the way the, the way these games work, it's pretty standard. You can run around, jump off platforms. You've got your double jump. You've got your wall. Classic. Your wall jump. Uh, you can slide, which is a Mario thing. Uh, <laughs> slide in your tummy. I don't uh, know if that's exclusive to Mario, but <laughs> no, they do. <laughs> yeah. <it's awesome. laughs> Mario 3D. I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was it's a more Mario, of a Mario, Mario 64 thing. because it wasn't from the 2D Marios. Uh, and you play as this little girl with a top hat. And this is where the hats come in. You start the game and she's in her bedroom on her spaceship because she has a huge spaceship that she's uh, travelling home in. Uh, and that sort of serves a little bit as the tutorial as well. It gives you a chance to sort of leap off the walls and 
jump about and right. she's, she's got a big pile of cushions in her room that you can jump into and a bit like a ball pit with cushions uh and you go down to the main uh, the bridge if you like <laughs> the, the main room uh and while you're there someone from the nearby mafia planet <laughs> oh, comes and chaps in the window and demands like payment like tax for traveling past their planet and she's like like sticks her tongue out um and he smashes the window and all of her time pieces will fly out the window oh these, no these are these are your 40 precious time pieces and they're like little hourglasses your 40 precious MacGuffins. yeah and they all fly out the window and get distributed they start falling from the sky onto all the planets that uh, are in the nearby vicinity so you're tasked with recovering your little hourglasses so that you can continue your journey and the spaceship that you're in is the hub if you've played any of these games this has a hub area and the first place you can go to is the mafia planet and so you beam down to there there's uh it's a big uh town mafia town it's called and it's like a beach town <laughs> it's, it's very very like mario uh, mario sunshine in this regard so you're by the sea and there's all these weird sort of russian sounding mafia dudes who are the monsters and you can jump around in the buildings and uh there's always thing it's, it's a collect-a-thon i found that out i didn't know that was a term today but i think it is a, a kind of apt term for these kind of games because you collect things and like you're collecting the time pieces but there's umpteen other things for you to collect as well like the the little jewels are called pawns p-o-n-s uh but they're basically the same as mario's coins or sonic's rings or whatever you just run around collecting those they're everywhere they're a currency you can use them to buy stuff uh once you get once you do whatever you have to do uh on the particular level to get the hourglass and it might be beating a boss or taking part in a race or there's all these different things uh once you get and you go back to your spaceship and it'll unlock another level and then when once you collect enough time pieces there are new planets you, you can go to uh, and there are different levels or acts, as they call it in this game. And it's non-linear. So you don't have to do things in order. You, you know, you, you stuff unlocks faster than than you do it. So you, yeah, if you yeah, see yeah. what I mean. So Aye. you can go to one place if, it's, if you don't like that particular planet or if you're finding a level too hard, you can go somewhere else. It encourages you to revisit levels because there will be places you can get to that you couldn't get to before because you have unlocked new powers which is where the hats come in because she has all these different hats that she can wear uh i did think this is where this was going with the hats yeah uh <laughs> and you know you start with a hat her top hat which doesn't really doesn't let you get anywhere it shows you where you need to go like it shows you where the uh hourglass might be uh but then you get new ones like one that lets you sprint one that lets you uh, hook, uh not hook shot uh, one that lets you throw little bombs uh and various other things don't want to spoil what some of them do but uh, <laughs> and there's 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 all these other little things that you can buy and upgrade so there's like little pins that go in your hat that give you supplementary abilities like there's one that sucks in the collectibles in a certain radius uh oh i try to remember oh yeah there's like a parasol because uh that she, she hits things with her umbrella but there's a pin that if you fall uh really long distance normally you would get damaged by that if you but if you've got the little parasol pin she'll open her umbrella at the last minute and you won't take damage and so you have loads of these but you can only choose so many of them you can only have so many of them pinned to your hat at a given time right so a standard mechanic so you pick and choose them just based on what you uh what you feel is most apt or your personal preferences and that's kind of i mean there's others there's there's other things to the, there's other abilities as well like there is a hook shot as well uh like in zelda that you use to platform uh, uh, swing from uh, various things like lampshades or the <laughs> sort of handily placed uh, uh metal rings just in the sky with a helicopter not a helicopter like, like a propeller or a balloon on the top of them just like conveniently placed around the place so you can get onto the top of that lighthouse over on the other side of the town <laughs> uh if it 
if it sounds like Mario 64 or Mario Galaxy or any of those, that's because it is. It's virtually identical, right? I think, to me. Uh, it's almost like a clone because it plays the same, it feels the same, and you do the same stuff, and you f- this idea of it's platforming, but you can kind of... It's easy-ish, flowing platforming. Like you've got so many... Like it's not just jump once, you can jump twice and then you're off the wall and then you can jump again and then you can do the slide thing and you get another jump. So you get all these chances to, to get to where you're going and also to make really long jumps. Uh, and So you're, you're swinging and jumping and uh, flowing through the levels. That's the idea anyway. And that's what they try to mm. make Mario, the Mario games like and they try to go for, for that in this game as well. And it does, it does work like that to an extent. Uh, and it's fun. Uh, it's cute. It's got this sort of cutesiness to it, and it's humorous. It's very much... I mean, I keep saying games it's being influenced by, but it's its heavily influenced by Psychonauts as well, if you played that. I've very humor. briefly played Psychonauts, yeah. yeah. The, that style, that Tim Schafer style of humour is definitely what they're going for. So it's fully... Well, it's almost fully voiced, and it's quite wacky. And it's hard to describe that kind of humour. You have to see it. Yeah, yeah, can't yeah. really describe that, <laughs> but it is, it is, it's pretty good. It's never going to be as good as Psychonauts because it has some of the most amazing like levels that people still remember to this day. And they have a, there is a level in A Hat in Time that is virtually a tribute to the Milkman conspiracy in Psychonauts, um, right. the, <laughs> which, which people will know if they've played it. It has these sort of weird agents, the G-Men they're called in Psychonauts, uh, these sort of stereotypical secret agent like spy versus spy and they've got a big oh, they've right. got a, tro- a trophy <laughs> hat on and a big coat and you can't see their face you can just see two eyes and it's like dark and they say all these sort of weird things so they have the, a level that has the same sort of thing in uh, a hat in time and it's, it's a good level it's fun uh, I mean the only thing about it which is the thing is this this is a small company it's an, definitely an indie game. It was kickstarted, and I think they raised like three hundred thousand dollars in Kickstarter. I don't know how much. Obviously, I don't know how much additional funding they got for it, if any. It's not a huge amount of money to make a game that's like uh, Mario Galaxy, let's say. So it is unpolished. Right. Yeah. A lot of the problems that plague three D platformers, like it's almost like it's too retro, because. It has a lot of the issues that early 3D platformers had, like with the camera. I mean, the camera's good, but sometimes you'll get in a corner and the camera, you'll be like, I can't see where I am. I can't see where I'm going to jump. So you just, you're kind of blind. You get jammed behind stuff sometimes. You can get to places in it that you shouldn't really be able to get to. Uh, Like you can jump onto the tops of things that I'm like, you wouldn't normally be able to get on or behind bits of the scenery yeah, yeah. You shouldn't really be able to get into. Uh, and the look of it is too retro, I think. It doesn't look nice. Well, it's it's kind of strange because there's been like a... It's almost like a mini resurgence in these kinds of games um, recently. I mean, it's particularly like... So last year, for example, Ukulele came out, mm-hmm. which is a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie, yeah. which is a very similar game to what you're describing. Mm-hmm. It's a game that I played a lot when it was um, back in the N64, I think yeah. it was. Um, but Ukulele got the same criticism about like camera angles and oh, it's hard. the retro style. Even and- even the, the latest Mario's are not perfect in that regard. Aye. And, and they're really, really good. They're amongst like the best... like. Uh, of these games that there's ever been I mean they're massively uh, critically acclaimed all of them uh, and it's, it's difficult and to just design 3D platforming games and to design the levels is not and to have them be fun and a pleasure to play is a real skill and it takes I assume it takes a lot of time and effort mm. you can't just put a load of buildings in a town and say oh yeah it looks like a town now That it won't be fun to platform around in Everything has to be very carefully considered. Uh, so even if you just go from like, it's, even if it's just a room rather than an open area and you're getting from one side to the other, each one, you can't just say, right, this is here's a few platforms, off where I go. No, each one has to be considered as a thing and you're like, this has to be right. Uh, yeah. And that's, it's difficult. And that is reflected in this game because there's bits of it that are not genuinely not fun. 
like <laughs> platform bits when I'm just like, this is horrible. I've like tried to do it umpteen times and just getting really frustrated with it. And I feel it's not because I'm not good enough. It's the game itself is fighting with me. But the other thing I was saying is the, the, the look of it, I don't think it looks good. Mm. I th- part of the problem, the cut is really garish. It, it's just too much like an old game. The color, the color palette in it is just mental, and like <laughs> they've, there's a lot of missing textures on stuff. It's inconsistent as well. Some some areas are fully textured, other bits they've just got no textures. It's just the, the light ingredients on things, uh, and that it's too much like an old game. And so it looks like you're playing a game from the PlayStation, but it's in high res. Mm. And that's not a good look. No, like, they've not actually, for a modern there, game like that. There's no. a patch coming out, uh, or sorry, DLC coming out that's adding a low res mode. And I saw some screenshots of it, and I was like, "Yeah, it looks better. It's, <laughs> it's two four two forty p. It's a two forty lines uh, of resolution." And I was like, "Yep, that's definitely improved it because now it looks like an old game, whereas before it, you've got just the sharpness of ah, the yeah, current yeah. high def, and then this sort of really low def low like." textures uh it's a shame because it does for me it detracts but i mean that might just be me because this is another game that people seem to love on steam at least uh another overwhelmingly positive well aye but i think that's because i mean going back to like ukulele that's again some of the criticism level i never played this game by the way and i would actually be quite interested in playing it because i'd really enjoyed banjo kazooie but I think they were basically saying that like this this is nostalgia. This is what you're feeling. It's nostalgia. It's not it's not because you like the game. It's it's because you want to like the game. Yeah, it could be. I think there's a little bit of the Kickstarter effect on it as well. Aye, well there is that. I, I think there is that. There's there's possibly a bit of that, but that's that's just speculation on my part. But I mean not to take away from it, it when it works, it's a good game. Uh and it's it's fun to play, uh, and I'm not sad I played it. And I'm gonna, I, especially just for the humor, uh, I'm gonna see it through because it's worth it for that. Oh, and uh, although I'm not super keen in the graphics, music amazing, really really good. And it, cool. And it's like it's only and also it's only the 3D graphics that I don't like. the The guy who does the art, the 2D stuff, it's brilliant. It's just this weird retro 3D realization of it that I, I'm not super keen on, but everything else is uh, is really fine and accomplished. Uh, yeah, and you can it's out on just about everything: uh, Mac OS, PC, PlayStation Four, Xbox, and apparently even coming to Switch. It's coming to the Switch. Yep, I was just going to say, I'm which people that now. will be delighted about. Um, and that's by Gears for Breakfast. Yeah. What a name. I know. They've got, they've got a good logo. It's like a big pile of gears and then sausages and eggs and things on oh, top that's, of them. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> and uh, speaking of Psychonauts, apparently Psychonauts 2 is coming out very, oh, very people soon. Will be, uh, well, I, I, will I be would be excited that. about that. Uh, I'll was, own Psychonauts. I might go back and play it. It'll be difficult because it's old and the platforming in it is old. Ah, and it wasn't even at the, <laughs> even at the time people weren't they were like they didn't play it for the platforming mm. they didn't yeah, yeah, like yeah, there's yeah, co- yeah. there was like the various things that you collect and it was a bit mm, can't remember what they were called the memories or something but the uh, the humor in it in the story in it is just bonkers mm-hmm. <laughs> that was one of the things I did remember about because I, yeah. I can't remember exactly how much I played this was a long time ago and it gets better but, later this is the other thing You'd, like the first few levels especially the the first level is like. Mm. It's like it's pretty horrible. Basic braining, I think it was called, uh, and uh, it's it's not. There's there's nothing too exciting about that. And then there's a couple of others after that that aren't that much better. And then it really just kicks into gear. With some of them are just insane. It's such a good game. So that'll be interesting. People will have high expectations for that sequel. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much, Dave. Hmm. And that's not an early access game. No. <laughs> Okay, right, let's move on. We've got one more thing to talk about. Hey. Um, something that uh, you and I have been playing together. Yep. As a cooperative team. A pleasurable team. A pleasurable, um, team, a pleasurable time. Pleasure, pleasurable time on the high seas as we've been playing Raft. 
which is uh, another uh, survival game. So, you know, we've fallen into the trap of playing survival games together again, Dave. Uh, another survival crafting game. But they're <laughs> just... Just when... Was it? Just when I think I got out, they pull me back in. <laughs> it's very true. I found myself playing Seven Days to Die again the other day. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? Uh, anyway, so in Raft, Raft's a bit different. A wee bit different in terms of the... It the, is. The, the, the style, the theming of it, and what you actually get up to in it. Um, because you start the game mysteriously floating in a pretty much empty sea um, on a raft, which is tiny. Um, it's If you want to talk about it in sort of gamey terms, it's a two-by-two two square raft. Um, and what I mean is that it's made up of four small squares. Um, and you can add more squares to this raft as you go through, and you can make it absolutely fucking massive, which is basically what me and Dave did. Uh, but we'll get to that, because, like you say, you can play this cooperatively, so I don't think... I think I had started building the raft a little bit more before you joined in the game, hadn't you? Yeah, I think you, you did a lot of the, the sort of early, the ground work. early ground work. When I turned up, there was a, quite a sizable raft. Yeah. Uh, if I recall. But yeah, so you start the game on this raft, it's tiny, and all you have um, for companions is a hook, which is on a, str- is on a rope, and a shark, who is uh, constantly circling your raft and every so often will just latch onto it and try and tear a piece off. Um, yeah. The shark is a bastard, <laughs> um, but he's, he's, he's a constant feature in this game. Uh, so your your hook uh, will be used. This this is going to be your primary tool for the the first uh, hour of the game, pretty much, and probably longer. In fact, you use it all the way through. Uh, it has it has yeah. another use. Yeah. Um. But we'll get to that later. But yeah, it, the, the, it is your primary tool in this game, and certainly at the beginning of the game, it's pretty much all you'll use. Um. So there's various bits of debris just floating about in the sea. So there's bits of plastic. There's wooden planks. Um. There's sort of leaves giant leaves floating around um, and there are barrels delicious barrels delicious barrels which you can have various things in them um, all of the above and pretty much some other things maybe bits of food and stuff like that um, yeah because you got to eat in this game yeah you got to eat you got to drink and can't drink the seawater yeah don't drink the seawater that's a bad idea <laughs> it, it doesn't help um so yeah, you're using your hook to just basically throw it out into the water and then you can just reel it in and anything that it, that you go through basically with your hook as you're reeling it back in will be hauled in towards you. So you'll just be grabbing planks and grabbing leaves and grabbing bits of plastic. Um, and when you do that, you can add extra bits to your raft. So you can go into, like, you've got a crafting menu that you can, you know, you're going to have to make a hammer. And so you make your hammer and that can let you add extra bits to your raft and you can make things like spears so when the shark attacks you, you can just go and stab him in the face a few times and that gets rid of him. Um, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like that at all. And in fact, he gets more and more bloody the more you do it. Uh, and eventually he will die. And you will have a brief respite from the, the shark behaviour and then five minutes later, the shark's back. <laughs> He's circling your raft again. <laughs> so yeah, you can, like, you, you can expand your raft. You can just put more sort of foundation bits down so you need like wooden plastic to do that um and you can build little walls around the side of it if you want um pro tip don't build walls around all of it because if you fall in the water you're not going to get back on the bloody thing if you do that yeah it's, di- it's difficult enough when there isn't a wall <laughs> exactly. spend a lot, of, a lot of time when you fall off and the shark's biting you in the arse and you're trying to get back on and you're like shit i'm under the raft <laughs> panicking so yeah, I did a lot of the early groundwork. Before Dave joined in, I had built... Uh, I don't know how big had I got that sort of floor area of the raft. I it don't think I'd built the second huge, level yet. But No, but we had the we had the basics. So we had the uh, cooker. We had the, what, I had the set up a cooking... Was it a bucket? Possibly something like of, that. Sort of like a brazier. Uh, and a water purification type deal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is very inefficient. Yeah, you were boiling the water. So yeah. You had to burn your precious planks. Uh, so we had that set up in like a chest or two. I think that was pretty much it. And the research table, I think, was the other thing. Oh, yeah. Possibly got, had. Of course, there's a research table. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, the game's kind of driven by the crafting menu. It, because yeah, it, it you would do in nothing game. in this game if it wasn't for the fact of, well, what happens if I build this thing that I can build? It's true. Because that's basically all that happens. Because, I mean, 
we got to a point in the game, well, I'm skipping the end game here, but we got to a point where we were just like, well, there's only two things left that we haven't built yet, so let's build build those things and see what happens. Mm. And that was mm. basically it, because this, I mean, the thing is, the game is in early access, like, and I think it's quite early access. Um, I mean, it's a solid enough game as it is right now. I wouldn't say it's buggy or anything like that. No, um, no, it's not. But I think that the the actual sort of story side of it, which is virtually non-existent, to be honest. Um, but they're, I think... Th- they're still... I th- well, I haven't been on to their uh, forums or anything to check, but I get the impression they're still... They're still working on it. Yeah, I don't think they quite know what they're going to do with it. <laughs> right, yeah. I've got that, that impression. Yeah, they're... They, like, it, and I can understand that because it's maybe difficult to know what's, what's for the best uh, to do with this game in terms of the story. Because and like the shark as well, because people are, people have mixed opinions about the shark. Uh, mm-hmm. Some people are not; they just don't like the idea that he comes, attacks you. Eventually, you kill him, and, and then he and just he comes, comes back, back again. again. Yeah. And he never that that's this. And never changes. Yeah, I mean, there's one thing you can do: you can you can make shark bait uh, and throw that into the water, and he'll munch that for a bit, which gives you a chance to uh, go diving. But that, that's the limit, really, of your interactions with the shark. So he's not a particularly dynamic or interesting adversary, shall we say. No. But So some people feel that way. I don't mind. I, I think he's quite fun. Uh, just, <laughs> I quite like it. So, But again, it's hard to know what to do. Uh, and I think there's the risk that if they make any drastic changes, you lose some of the spirit of this game. Because it's the way it plays is quite unique. And it has a certain feel to it. Mm-hmm. A kind of somewhat relaxed feel to it if it wasn't for the shark well yeah it's 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 relaxed in one sense it's not relaxed because you never stop doing anything in this game because it's relentless but uh you like you always have to do stuff you can't just stand around and like look at the the horizon because i in this game i've I've never played a survival game where your food and water level goes down so fast yeah it's pretty just you, like I say, you it's just can't. On. You're either you're like, okay, what do I do next? Oh, I'll probably eat something, drink. Yeah. Okay, right, let's go get this. Oh, I'm running out of wood. I better address that. And then, oh, what were we crafting? Oh, we need to go and make something for that. So we were constantly on the go. So in that sense, it's not relaxed, but the feel of it is, and it's because you're on this raft and you're not in an open world, and that this is the the cool thing about it, and it's clever as well. Uh, because we're not just out in the ocean. Every so often, the raft moves. You move in the current, and also you can build a sail. Or you uh, can paddle. You can paddle as well <laughs> with your paddle, which will break after about like one. 20 strokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the durability of the items is, is, quite, uh, is quite low as well. Well, another, that's another thing. That's, yeah, that's the why game is full on because going. of that. You're like, oh, right. Oh, well, that's my spear broken. That. Yeah, oh, I, I'm sure I had a fishing rod. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> make, make a new one of those. And... You, you encounter other things in the sea. Other rafts, initially. Yep, abandoned rafts. So that's quite nice. And they have some stuff in a chest. And generally, it has... The abandoned rafts have one chest on, and when you empty that chest, the raft sinks. For uh, some inexplicable reason, the raft just goes, Bye! <laughs> don't, don't really know why that is. Maybe that's... I don't know, maybe that was a balancing... Maybe people were exploiting that somehow. <laughs> I can't think what it was. Uh, and the other thing you encounter are islands. Yes. And they're tiny, these islands. They're they not are big small, at all. Yeah. But, and it's just, so you'll be like, it's, and it's, uh, it's not that you're traveling a world. There's not a map. Mm-hmm. These are just. Or even a compass. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just in a, in a infinite ocean, really, uh, in a sense. And so you're not really moving in a direction. You're not going anywhere. So these things are just events that are triggered. Every so often a, a raft will come past and, or it will say, we will spot an island off in the distance and then we have to try and get there by a combination of sailing and paddling, possibly. Uh, and I just... And it's that cycle because the, the islands have resources on them, as you probably guess. Uh, so I just really enjoyed that that cycle of uh, here's an island and we'd go up to it and you can build an anchor eventually because initially initially we didn't oh god I <laughs> initially we didn't what have a an anchor so we just <laughs> we just try and keep the raft next to the island by, a by pointing the sail at it pointing the sail <laughs> paddling so like and then Chris would be like on the island and I'd just be on the raft doing other stuff and then Chris would be like Dave you're like miles away now <laughs> so Dave like, where's my raft gone <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not sure what happened. What happened? We never, what would happen if we got really far apart? Oh, I don't know, actually. We did That's just, an interesting we did just point. warp one of us to the raft or something. I don't know. We never tried that. Because there must be a limit. Because, like, like I say, it's not a true open environment that you're in. Maybe we just hit an invisible wall and see you can't go any further apart. What would be quite funny if it would be if it just kind of dragged me off the island into the water towards you. <laughs> That's probably why it would do. <laughs> That's probably what's happening. But yeah, yeah. It is, uh, th- this, so it is a survival crafting game, but you're right. This is a survival crafting game with a completely different feel to it from other survival crafting games. And that's what makes it unique and and, and fun. Yeah, and um, it's, it's kind of a because you'd be like, oh, it's a survival crafting game without an open world. It was like, well, yeah. how, how's that a thing? But it is in this game and it does work. And base building in this game, if you want to call it base building because it's raft building, but base building in this game is quite important. It's not just the case of, oh, let's just make things, you know, look pretty or just make it look functional. You need to make space. You need to make you expand your raft and make space for things to go in if you want to get towards the sort of end game point in this thing. Mm. And getting onto some of these islands is quite difficult. And what we had to do was basically build a really tall tower on top of a raft with a, like a diving board on it, basically, and just jump off the top of it. And interestingly, there's no fall damage in this game. So you can build your raft as high as you possibly, as high as, yeah. The game will allow you to build it and fall off it, and nothing will happen. So there, there's no uh, like physics model for the raft itself. Mm. So you know, there's no there's no issues with buoyancy or center of gra- center of gravity in particular. <laughs> <laughs> yes, aye, that's very true, but, and that's very important, in fact, in this game because otherwise, the raft that we built would have sunk a long time ago. <laughs> But the raft was huge by there. Like we'll put some pictures up on uh, like Twitter and Facebook and stuff um, of what a raft looked like, and it was so big that I had to like I couldn't even get the whole thing in the yeah <laughs> in, was... in this shot. I mean, this is me standing on an island at the furthest away point I could get to, and I still just couldn't get the the how tall the the raft was. It was an impressive some, vessel. Yeah, it was pretty cool because we had some like we had different levels. We had like what sort of three levels and or is it four levels and then. Uh, and then the tower on top of that. Yep. Uh, the boarding tower. <laughs> <laughs> but like different levels, we had like the sail on the second, uh, the second, well, the first floor. If you want to, be we moved to sail around UK. a lot. It took us a while to find a. We, we found a perfect spot for it. Eventually, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's, there's there's wee things that you can do. For example, every time you kill a shark, you can get into the water beside its body and stab it a few times after it's dead and get lots of delicious shark meat and yep. its head. Yeah. And then you can go and mount its head on a wall somewhere. And Dave named them all. Um, I think I think he started naming them after Bee Gees at one point, but I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a Morris, right enough. There was, oh yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, because you can give them a little name. They have a plaque, uh, a little nameplate under them, so you can. How many shark heads did we have at the end? Oh, I don't know. Nine or ten, something like that? At least, yeah. We didn't even get all of them, but yep. And getting to the end game, we're, we're not going to ruin the end game thing, but like you say, it, it feels completely unfinished because you kind of get to the end game point of it um, and it just like, kind of goes, here's an achievement for you, and then nothing really happens. <laughs> so you can just keep playing the game after that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of strange. You, you, you find out a wee sort of a lore thing just to keep Pavel happy um, about like the world itself that you're on. Yeah. Um, but other than that, there's nothing really happens. And this is, you know, this is what we were talking about earlier. We think that there's definitely some work that needs to be done or should be done on that, I think. And they probably will be. But like you say, it definitely feels like they didn't really know what to do at that point. They just made a sort of cool game. Yeah. I think I get that impression. But it is cool. I really enjoy playing it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. It was it was fun to play. Um it, it was it was the whole thing just about the fact that there was always stuff you needed to do. So like, like you say, you you couldn't stop. And that was that was interesting for me because you, you get to a kind of point in stuff like Seven Days to Die, for example, where you're sitting there and you're going, Right, I'm well fed, I don't need to do anything, my base is pretty much impenetrable, you know. What will I do now? And you never really got to that point in Raft because there was no easy solutions to, like, food and water and um, your weapons. You, you can make metal weapons rather than wooden weapons once you get to a certain point. But, you know, they're still not going to last forever. 
no, and you're using up. You're, you're just precious, constantly just using resources. Precious metal that you need for other things. You need, to, yeah, other important things. But uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the, it was a fun, it's a fun game, and it would be interesting to see what they actually do with the story and if they're going to add more into it. Um, we get the feeling that there might have been something else to the end game point. There may have been other things that we could have gone and done, but it, from what we'd read, it didn't seem like it was that worthwhile. Like it was just going to be the same thing. I'm yeah, a, is the, no, I, I got that I'm impression. sure you were saying that anyway. Yeah, I think... Uh, I mean, well, we've crafted everything, so... Well, that's it, aye. <laughs> like, like I say, I, the, the game is driven by the crafting <laughs> menu. And once you craft everything, you're kind of like, okay, well, that's that then. Because... <laughs> <laughs> And it's just you and the shark. <laughs> that's that's the real end game, Dave. The shark that's, becomes that's your best mate. That's what I was mate. thinking. They must. They need to. De- that's that's what they can do. They can just have some sort of development with the shark. Like maybe it'll turn out it can talk. And it'll, it'll come up out of the water and, and give you a quest. Give <laughs> you a big shining light around it. <laughs> they'll be like, "Why have you been killing all my all my brothers?" Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that's Raft, and that is by uh, Red Beat Interactive Developed. Now, it's published by Axelot Games, and they did uh, a game which has a very similar art style to uh, Raft. Um, it's called Scrap Mechanic, which right. was a sort of like one of these silly physics games where you could basically just build stupid vehicles in a sandboxy environment. Um, using sort of like various bits of scrap, apparently. Uh, but uh, I've had some hilarious... That, that game's had me in tears of laughter. Um, scrap mechanic, because of the physics in it. So you can, get, uh, <laughs> like, you can build stupid rockets and stuff, um, but like build them in such a way that you have so many engines on one side when you turn them on, you spin uncontrollably and your character model starts bending out of shape. <laughs> um, I'm just... I'm so easily amused when it comes to these things. So. And they are a lot of fun those games but yeah scrap mechanic is actually quite fun so <laughs> have a go of it um okay well we are gonna have to wrap up um sorry i should have said that uh, raft is early access and it came out uh the 23rd of may according to this uh so yes let's wrap up this video games episode um this is episode 92 so still continuing the <gasps> countdown to 100 are you excited dave uh, moderately. Moderately excited? Okay. Yeah. Are you, do you think you're going to get more than moderately excited as we get closer to 100? I think... Or will well, you maintain yeah. a constant level of excitement? <laughs> I, do, I, do, I do maintain a pretty constant level. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll vouch for that. That's pretty much Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will, uh, we'll give out all our internet stuff. Um, if you want to email us, get in touch with us for any reason, uh, you can do so at firstplayertoken at gmail.com. That's F I R S T player token. Um, you can find us, found us, you can find us on all the uh, social media stuff, for example, Facebook and Twitter. Um, we have a Discord, it's discord.me slash firstplayertoken. Um, we have a PSN community. You can listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, basically most of the podcasting things if not all of them i'm losing track of them now uh we have a youtube um our twitch channel is first player token so for those twitch and twitter those are one st player token oh uh, that's one to player token thank you dave you're gonna have to take up that spot now that ewan's taking oh, a step back so uh you're gonna have to do the once to player token things from now on mm. um, do it before pavel does anyway <laughs> Uh, everything else, like I say, it's F I R S T, but Twitch and Twitter, one S T player token. And we are part of the Podnos Network, the UK's leading entertainment podcast network. Beautiful, Dave. Well done. Thank you. I'd ask you if you've got any news, but that's not really your thing. Uh, yeah. Ewan's our correspondent for that. So we'll get an, an mm. update on Podnos uh, <laughs> on the next Board Games episode. Um, but if you want to go and check out the Podnos Network, you can do so at podnos.com. Uh, there's a whole load of podcasts on there on a variety of different topics, um, and a lot of them are really good. Uh, and other news, by the time that you've listened to this, we will have attended Tabletop Scotland in Perth, which is the big board gaming convention there. Um, we're hopefully going to meet up with some of the other podcasters and various other people in sort of Scottish board gaming media. 
um, play a load of games and stuff. So our next board games episode will most likely just be a rundown of all the things that we got up to at Tabletop Scotland and what it was like and all that kind of thing. Yeah, um, slagging off all the nerds. Yes, yeah, slag off some nerds. Um, let's see if let's have a competition to see who can find the biggest nerd. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> It's probably one of us. <laughs> if Pavel was coming, it would definitely be him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we'll I we will be back with a board games episode next time, but until then, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.